This video is sponsored by Paradox Interactive. Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and with the arrival of a new DLC and a new update for Crusader Kings 3, we are back with another look at some great starts you can attempt across the start dates, focused of course, around this new DLC. The base game is currently free to play on Steam for an entire week up until the 21st of March, and you can learn more about it and the new DLC at the link I've included in the description and pinned comment down below. I know with the ruler designer you can basically build anything you want, but these recommendations are for those seeking interesting pre-existing storylines, circumstances, and opportunities, some of which may even influence custom rulers you make as well. Now, without any more time to waste, and with Northern Lords loaded up, let's take a look at 7 Great Northern Lords Starts in Crusader Kings 3. Chieftess Author the Deep-Minded of Vesterland, 867 there are two options for a start in Iceland in this time period, and in my humble opinion, Chieftess Author is by far the more interesting one. Odd the Deep-Minded, featured in many Norse sagas, was a 9th century settler during the settlement of Iceland and is quite well depicted in-game as far as historicity is concerned, working of course around some conflicting records. Her arrival and settling in Iceland is what brought Christianity to the island, and that makes her a Catholic ruler in-game, with Norse culture. This creates an entirely different dynamic as far as potential alliances are concerned, since you're able to more easily forge alliances with other Christians, but will have to overcome the different faith penalty if trying to ally Asatru rulers, which is more or less impossible. Her own father is Asatru Norse, and you'll have a hard time even making him an ally. On which note, historically speaking, he supposedly died in the Scottish Isles, so at this start date, he's the chieftain of the Mon putting you in the line of succession for the Earldom of Mon. With a bit of work, you can acquire this title. You're also strong enough to conquer the small islands off the coast of Iceland and then Scotland, and you're also able to overpower some of the smaller lords on the Norwegian coast. You can use this to establish a power base, and as you're able to make diplomatic contact with continental Europe, you'll have access to more and more powerful potential allies. This is a challenging start that can have you form the High Kingdom of the North Sea a new decision available with this DLC. It requires quite a bit of you, including holding the kingdoms of Norway, England, and Denmark for 30 years, so it'll definitely take more than just one generation. Which brings us to the next topic. Your heir is the historically appropriate Thorstein the Red, but you'll notice that neither him nor any of your other children carry the quick trait. You should seek out a new spouse and try to retain that trait. If you want to make things really interesting, you can try for a matriarch run, try to have a daughter, disinherit your sons, and combat against the male-dominated expectations of your faith. If you want to really take this matriarchal approach to the next level, you can either collect enough piety to convert to a Satru, or send all your daughters, including your heiress, to receive a martial education from an Asatru guardian, converting their faith to a Satru. Then, when you reign as the daughter, you'll be able to make all the sisters into Shield Maidens, another new feature in this DLC. Shield Maidens gain prowess and martial, and can fight on the battlefield as a champion. You can only make close female family members of Germanic faith and Norse culture into Shield Maidens, and they must have a prowess over 12. They can decline the offer if they have certain personality traits, like craven folk aren't likely to want this honor, for example, but whether you go the Catholic Norse route or the Asatru Norse matriarch path, or a different path of your own choosing. Being the only female ruler in the area, as well as the only Norse Catholic in 867, is a pretty interesting start. Chieftain Thorgil of Orkneyar, 867 There's nothing like a good challenging start, and this small island off the coast of Scotland provides exactly that, and some great options along the way. Your character here will have a randomized set of traits and skills, so no two starts will play exactly the same, and this adds some good variables to an already challenging run. You can start by taking the small islands nearby, follow up with the conquest of Irish and Welsh counties, and then you can start making some bigger moves. With a bit of work, you can make an ally of Sudreyar or Jorvik, though you might eventually have to bump heads with them. This start puts the decision to elevate the Kingdom of Man and the Isles within reach with a decent challenge, you'll have to war with Sudreyar for the prerequisite titles. You'll have to keep yourself at or below the rank of Duke while doing so as well, and you'll need to acquire the Viking trait, 
which can only be done by personally leading raiding armies. You'll need to participate in over 20 raids as the leader, so you'll often visit Scandinavia, continental Europe, and the islands around you to rack those numbers up. This alone can make this objective quite an involved process. And then there's the matter of having to war with one of the most powerful dukes in the region to get the aforementioned titles. The new Pillage Dynasty legacy works wonderfully with all this raiding and warring, and since the decision itself grants you 2500 renown, you can make quite a bit of progress on your legacies when you accomplish it. Once that's done, if you still haven't had your fill, you can try and secure the High Kingdom of the North Sea, pursuing the objectives I detailed when talking about Chieftas Author. Here, the Adventure Legacy path might come in handy, at least at first. The increased diplomatic range will allow you to reach further into Sweden and Norway to declare war or forge alliances, where previously you wouldn't have been able to make contact. There are easier starts to chase these objectives, of course. Starting as Sudreyar or Jorvik gives you an easy upper hand and an accelerated start in the region, but that's exactly why the game recommends them as an easy option. Here, you have a definite sense of an uphill struggle. You can either succeed or go out in a blaze of glory. Either way, Valhalla awaits. Jarl Dyer, the Stranger of Konogarthur, 867. Another interesting semi-historical figure, Dyer may have been one of two important figures in the region, and the only foreign sources that reference him are the Arab historian al Masudi and Swedish historian Olaf von Dahlin, who suggests he was the grandson of Ragnar Lothbrok, as shown in the game. Historicity aside, Jarl Dyer is a ton of fun to play, with a large variety of options and some fantastic starting advantages. The genius trait is absolutely huge, helping create a fantastic stat line, and though your first son doesn't carry genius forward, as a 22-year-old yourself, you'll have plenty of time to produce a more ideal heir. Your siblings and father are all out of diplomatic reach, but you're a bastard anyway, so you won't find yourself in their lines of succession. But while they're busy up north, you're going to be busy down south. As you already hold Konogarthur, you just need to acquire fame and become exalted among men in order to found the capital of the Rus, a brand new decision resulting from this DLC. You can opt to embrace the local traditions, which will convert you to a Russian culture individual following the Slovanska Pravda unreformed Slavic faith. This can certainly help ease some of the tensions in the region, within your own holdings among vassals old and new, and also among neighbors. It is a fun extra challenge, however, to stay a Satru Norse, and you don't want to embrace local traditions if you want to retain some of the options that are exclusive to this new DLC. You can push to form the Empire of Russia, and starting with Jarl Dyer's host, you'll have a thousand levies, 200 Huskarls, and 200 Varangian veterans at your disposal right off the bat. You also start quite wealthy, which allows you to recruit quite a few mercenaries. Not even Bulgaria or Khazaria can stand against your full strength, should you choose to raise it, though you will have to seek out allies in case the Magyar Confederation gets any bright ideas. They are a powerful neighbor. If you're thinking of a less local approach, this is also a great start for the more adventurous type. Your position gives you a diplomatic range that reaches quite far out east, down south, right to Sicily, and even over to the Caucasus regions. As such, after you acquire a thousand prestige, you can use the brand new Varangian Adventure Casus Belli to uproot yourself and move to a new location. This particular element gives a fair bit of variety to the start. Will you establish Norse supremacy in southern Italy and North Africa? Will your saga take you to the steppe or even deeper into Asia? The Varangian Adventure Casus Belli is a new addition with this DLC, and with it you can declare war on any non-neighboring ruler as long as you are no higher level than a duke, and as long as it's the tribal era. Your old vassals will be given independence, your own titles will be given to warlords in your former home, while you yourself will take control of the war target, your landed family members will receive spare conquered counties, and your capital and everything will be moved alongside with you. You will also gain fame and the adventurer trait. You can initiate multiple adventures, though each subsequent adventure is more expensive than the last successful one, and only your first adventure grants you bonus soldiers. So, go from adventure to adventure, or found the capital of the Rus and establish the Russian Empire, or just spread your genius children far and wide. Jarl Dyer is a great option 
with a lot of potential variety. Jarl Rurik Troublemaker of Holmgarther, 867. A Varangian chieftain of the Rus, Jarl Rurik founded the Rurik dynasty, the ruling dynasty of Kievan Rus, and a dynasty that retained power up until 1610. You can move south towards Konogarther to found the capital of the Rus yourself, and you can hack your way down there, or anywhere really, with the help of Jarl Rurik's host of a thousand levies, 200 Huskarls, and 200 Varangian veterans. You can also enlist quite a few mercenaries with a sizable starting wealth. It's not a bad idea to actually head slightly west at first, as long as any one of your own titles is a coastal county in the southern and eastern Baltic coast region, you can forge the Yom's Vikings, giving you access to a holy order. You will be its patron, and you'll see the benefits of having founded a holy order as well. These extra warriors can further benefit your goals. You can always take the adventuring route instead, as described earlier as well, though creating the Kingdom of Novgorod, the Empire of Russia, and founding the capital of the Rus makes for a very fun storyline to follow. Chieftain Botolf of Sielti, 1066. The old ways are dying. The oppressive boot of the Christian god has changed the very fabric of Scandinavia, and a new culture has taken root. As Chieftain Botolf, though, you stay true to the old faith, starting as a Satru, and you find yourself surrounded by others who have retained their faith as well. You are one of the few Asatru rulers in this time, so you'll want to convert non-Asatru lands using your realm priest, and you'll need to ally with your neighbors, sometimes seeking hooks or improved relations in order to do so, especially with the Ukonusko Sami people to the north of you. Your relative strength in the area is middling, and it will be either through alliances or conquest that you will need to improve your military situation before the Christians turn their eyes on you. Fortunately, you have access to the Conquest and Kingdom Invasion Casus Belli options to help you conquer land while your Realm Priest continues to convert the locals to the right faith where applicable. To the south, Eric III, the Heathen of Sweden, can be a potential ally as well, since he remains a Satru too. One way or another, you'll want to try and get within diplomatic range of the Jarl of Iceland. Since you are not Norse, you cannot take the Adventurer Legacy Tree. But, if you conquer one of these islands from the King of Norway, you'll be able to send your children over to Iceland to truly bring back the ways of old. Have the Jarl of Iceland convert their culture through education. It's not a bad idea to devote yourself to Freyr at this point. This is a new option with a DLC for Asatru rulers, allowing you to determine a personal deity. Freyr increases fertility, and while you might use the other deities at other times, this increased fertility will allow you to have many children quickly, which will in turn increase the number of Asatru and potentially Asatru Norse people in the world. If the Jarl of Iceland can't take on more wards, you can always turn to his chieftain of Vesterland. Then, when you pass away and your Norse Asatru child takes control, you can bring back the old ways across the region, secure the High Kingdom of the North Sea, and if you want to go beyond the High Kingdom of the North Sea, there are two more holy sites that you might seek to liberate. Make close family members into shield maidens, and perhaps even become a stalwart leader so that you can challenge your rivals to duels. Raid repeatedly to gain the Viking trait, worship Thor to further improve your prowess, and lead from the front. Also, trial by combat with people outside your realm is always an option, but it just feels a little cooler when you take the rest of this storyline into account. Have children, give them land, and bring back the lost glory of the northern lords of old. Jarl Alfjör of Iceland 1066. This one is a very challenging, isolated start. You can do the reverse of the previous storyline, using the Adventurer Legacy Tree's Wanderlust to be able to send children and grandchildren off to be converted to Asatru, but starting as a Catholic Norse, you can pursue some powerful alliances while retaining access to Conquest and Kingdom Invasion Casus Belli. This can help you take the shattered Irish lands quickly to give you a solid foothold from which to launch future invasions, and because of your Catholic ways, you can ally nearby realms without having to worry about the different faith penalty. You can use this in more nefarious ways too. The Jarl always starts with an intrigue focus, though the spread of perks can be different each time. You can respec if you so wish, but one way or another, you can make it easier to find or fabricate secrets and hooks, perform abductions, and execute assassination plots. So, seek marriages with claimants or those in the line of succession, and use murder to spread your dynasty far and wide across the Christian realm. As the dynasty head, 
This will give you quite a bit of power in the form of titles you can claim as a dynasty head interaction, or realms you can call in to assist you as you pursue the High Kingdom of the North Sea, or whatever else your heart desires. It's a slightly different approach here, especially if you go the intrigue route, and with the culture-faith combination, there are some very fresh opportunities to be taken advantage of. Count Hestine of Montague, 867. If you've seen my 10 Great Starts video from the early days of Crusader Kings 3, this one will sound familiar, but it definitely bears repeating with all of the changes this new DLC introduces. If you haven't seen that video, it's got a few more recommendations that will be enhanced by this DLC as well, but I didn't want to just repeat a bunch of recommendations. You can check the video out linked in the description down below and under the eye at the top right corner of this screen. But you might be wondering why, of all the options in that video, am I choosing to repeat Count Hestine specifically? Well, Count Hestine leans heavily into his martial capabilities, with an extremely high martial skill and an extremely high prowess. He is quick, as is his heir, and he has the Viking trait to begin with, something that greatly helps with winning duels. He also starts with Adventurer, which pairs nicely with Fame and a travel itinerary. With his martial focus, you can improve Prowess, chasing the Gallant trait, and devoting yourself to Thor improves Prowess too. With such a high Prowess and the aforementioned traits, you can go around dueling your rivals, making new rivals to duel, and even challenging other Norse rulers to trial by combat with great impunity. Though, you'll need to try and find reasons to imprison them first for the last one, since trial by combat only applies to people you have an imprisonment cause against. Add all of this on top of the two sets of Count Hestine's hosts, both boasting 1,500 levies, 200 Huskarls, and 100 Varangian veterans each, and you have a very formidable force. Not only that, but the old adventurer tag can be applied a bit more directly here. The Varangian adventure Cassus Belly will allow you to jump from place to place, making a new home, making new rivals, dueling new people, and experiencing new cultures and faiths. The Adventurer Legacy Path is ideal for expanding the range of these Varangian Adventure Wars, and you can also reduce friction with local cultures as you go from place to place. Be careful though. With regards to dueling, if the difference between your and your target's prowess is too great, your rival will refuse. So you'll need to seek out increasingly more and more challenging rivals to really prove your worth. Count Hestine was already a flexible, variable, entertaining start, but all these newly added layers take him a step beyond. There you have it, seven great starts to try out or perhaps a revisit with the new Northern Lords DLC for Crusader Kings 3. If you have any questions or picks of your own you'd like to share, don't hesitate to do so in the comments down below. It's always fun seeing what others are checking out or having a particularly good time with. I have a few more videos planned for this new DLC, and you can expect a lot more Crusader Kings 3 coverage on the channel as well, so don't hesitate to subscribe if you're looking for more, and you might want to check out our Discord as well if you're looking for folks to play with. As always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. That'll keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.